last few weeks, we've been talking about combating anti-Christism, and we're seeing it rise in our culture uh, quite radically. And we're seeing more and more issues every single year where politics seeks to take a moral issue, issue and make it a political issue. And I've said many, many times over the years, never allow that to happen when people say, well, you know, what about this issue or this issue? Well, no, that's a moral issue. That matter is already settled. That's settled in heaven. Is homosexuality sin? Yes, that matter is settled in heaven. Is uh, uh, divorce a sin? Yes, that matter is settled in heaven. Is abortion murder? Yes, that matter is settled in heaven. That's a moral issue, not a political issue. Now, when it comes here to the issues of our combating this, the tools God has given us uh, is his word. And what we find in the Bible is what is called progressive revelation. Now, how many have ever heard that phrase before? A few of you? Okay. That means as situations arise... And questions arise, God has historically brought about additional revelation to deal with those things. That's why in the Old Testament we have uh, the prophets. That's why we have Psalms and Proverbs and the book of Ecclesiastes. These are as raising cultural issues that, that come up with God's people. That's why after the Gospels, we have the epistles. These are progressive revelations. And so, hitherto, the giving of that progressive revelation, the, the Christian or the believer had to get what he got from other books. Now, aren't you glad that God has given additional revelation, progressive revelation, to fill in the blanks and for us to say, oh, okay, that God gave that in this epistle or this epistle or this epistle. And that's what God did. And, and of course, in James, as he defines what faith is, and not so much uh, saving faith in that book, but about living faith. If you're a Christian, you ought to live what you believe. And so, as we've said, James 1.22, James said, be doers of the word and not hearers only. Deceiving your own self. We find in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 where Paul addresses that issue at the church of Corinth that's living in carnality. And he says, examine yourselves to whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. And I think that's a matter that every one of us ought to deal with. That's progressive. God says, okay, here's what's come up in Christianity. And now I'm giving you revelation, this was 30 years after Christ, to deal with those issues. And we have all kinds of that. They had corrupted the uh, second coming of Christ and the rapture of the church. And so Paul then writes 2 Corinthians, or 1 Corinthians, and then about a year later has to write a second epistle to, to the Thessalonians uh, to deal with it again. And there in chapter 2 and verse 7, he says that the mystery of inequity doth already work. Otherwise, the Antichrist, uh, even though the person isn't here, the system is in place. And it's beginning to increase quite rapidly. And he says it's going to keep going that way until he that letteth or hindereth, he that restrains, uh, is taken out of the way. And that's, of course, just the rapture of the church. It's getting worse. We find in Timothy, Timothy says, the last, or Paul says to Timothy, in the last days perilous times shall come. Men shall be lovers of their own selves. And that day w w is upon us. Now, this is all the mystery of inequity. How do Christians combat that? What's the best way? Well, what's the title of, on your slide here? We do it with a pure heart. And although they, we have a purified heart in the in dwelling of the Spirit of Christ who resides there, we have to yield to that being, that person, and then we can gain the pure heart. That's what we're going to look at today in verses 
1 through 11 of uh, 2 Peter. So you can go over there. We'll be re referencing that text. We'll be reading it here shortly, but uh, we're, we're going to get there first. <laughs> Many Christians are like the man who said, as a young man, I wanted to play the guitar really bad. Now that I'm old, I can honestly say that I can play the guitar really bad. And uh, that's kind of the way Christians are today. You're, you, you know, if, if, uh, I think it was uh, Thomas, no, no, the guy that invented the cars, uh, Ford, who said, uh, the person who does not think he can and the person who does not think he can, and thinks he can't is both right. However, if you don't think you can, you'll be right. And if you don't think, if you think you can't, you'll be right. Otherwise, you're not going to try anything. That's why Ford was so successful. I watched an analogy of Thomas Edison and his co-partner in it, who, in order to get the light bulb invented, uh, spent 10,000 failures before they found one work. When would you have quit? That's a that's an issue that we have here in our text. The point here is our first slide is spiritual strength is available to all born again believers as a choice to yield to the indwelling spirit of Christ. That's Romans six eleven through thirteen, and this is the pure heart that's available to all born again believers. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And so what should we do? We want to make sure our heart's pure. Now why is it that so many Christians are spiritually anemic? No power. Why are so few Christians sin conscious? Even less soul conscious. Otherwise... The needs of others. Why, why is it? Why is it that revival tarries when God desires to save thousands of people, whole cities, and even nations? It's a hard issue. The primary reason is that many Christians no longer can define holiness or long for holiness in their lives. You have a general conversation with most people about what holiness is and they don't want to have that conversation. Biblical standards. What is holiness? What is holy in the eyes of God? They don't want to have that conversation. If they do, it's going to be a reductionist conversation. They're going to be taking away from the equation all the things that God says is not right. What we call biblical standards. Why? Well, they're more concerned about what, uh, with what they can get by and still call themselves Christians. So how do you do that? You empty out the definition of holiness. You empty it out. So there's very little there any longer. So this type of Christian has a serious heart problem that will never release the pure heart of Christ that's indwelling in them. Never going to happen. So, if Christians want a clean life that God can bless and use, they must determine to have a pure heart. That's got to be our goal. We've got to come, do, come, come to the Lord. Let me say this. I don't mean this to be critical, but I think I'm trying to be honest. I think Catholics confess their, their sins more to priests than, than many of us confess our sins to God. Now think about that. When is the last time you just spent a season prayer uh, daily just going to God and confessing your sins? There are Catholics that do that every day. They go to confession every day. Now they've got to go to a priest. You don't have to do that. You can do it while you're driving down the road or riding your bike or, or any time of the day. In fact, you know, you don't need a, a, a priest because you are a priest. Before God, if you're a believer. So the word of God clearly states that the real spiritual struggle is waged for the control of the heart. 
And that control is not so much from outside forces, but it's from with our own, our own nature. We're not willing to yield our hearts to the Lord. Now, anything you're holding back in that yielding is not yielding. So it has to be complete. It has to be total. It has to be without reservation. Everything I am and everything you want, Lord, I want everything I am, I yield to you. So when the Bible speaks of self-control, it means the control of the inner desires and carnals, the carnality, the, the purpose, the carnal purposes in life. When the heart is pure, then Jesus is the governor of that life, and his Holy Spirit leads that believer's life with the word of God. Now what does that mean? Remember years ago when we, I don't know how many of you remember this, but years ago when I was a kid, uh, you'd go to a, go, a, a place called a, a, a go-kart track. Anybody remember any of that? And you'd get onto these go-karts and you thought, boy, you know, you're going to be able to go and there'd be no limitations on what you could do. And, but they had a governor on those things. And so you could only go so fast. And so you're thinking, I'm getting, I'm going to go zipping around this track and go, put, 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 put. and it wasn't really much fun. But every now and then, they'd, uh, you'd have the place where you'd go to and you could take this co-cart without a governor and just have fun with it. And we had one uh, like that when we were kids and burned up the roads and burned off our tires and, and uh, didn't kill anybody, including ourselves. But uh, uh, you know, that's a concept of what God says. He, he governs our heart. When he governs our heart, the throttle can be wide open. Because he's in control of the results. And that's what God wants. So Proverbs 4.23 gives us this commandment. Keep thy heart, how? With all diligence. Now what's that mean? Anyone want to give me a shot at that? What does that mean? Keep your heart with all diligence. Go ahead, guess the most you can be is wrong. What does that mean? Hmm? Okay, purity. Diligence. What does it mean to be diligent? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you have to work at it. So you have to be diligent. It's got to be a focus of your life, it's got to be a priority. So you, your responsibility, according to God, is to keep your heart. With all diligence, it has to be a major effort. Not going to happen by accident. It's going to require some effort. Why? For, because, out of it are the issues of life. That's what we've already said. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Now, think about that. Why do some things come out of your mouth that you know shouldn't come out of your mouth? How about outburst of anger? Irresponsible uh, things that we say. Why do they come out of our heart? Now, that's why James says, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. What's he talking about? The tongue. You, that's why you have to control the heart. What is a heart? It's the source and center of our emotions. So there's only one throne in your heart. Just one. You occupy that throne when your heart is governed by selfish desires and carnal purposes. Not a good thing. Every now and then you wake up and say, oh, okay, I'm on the throne again. Shouldn't have let that happen. What do you do? You go to God. You confess what you did. You allowed yourself to have control of your heart. Self-control. Rather than yielding to him. So when your heart is pure. It's brought under the control of the Holy Spirit. And led by the truth of God's word. Only then is Jesus Lord of your life. Now, he's Lord of your life all the time. I, I want you to know that. You can't ever make Jesus Lord. He is Lord. 
But when in the practical sense, Jesus is, is uh, Lord of your heart, when he is upon the throne of your heart and he's in control, then he is in a practical way the Lord of your life. Now I try every single day to begin my day off with that. Otherwise I go to the Lord, I confess my sins, I confess that I am a sinner. I confess that I am a man of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. I ask for the cleansing of the blood of Jesus Christ, and I ask for the filling of the Holy Spirit. And I yield. Lord, in any way you might use me today, um, I would be eternally grateful. That's a good way to begin a day. Did you begin that way before you came to church today? Do you do that before you begin your Bible study and devotions? Do you do that before you go to prayer and ask God to petition God for some of the things you need or want? To make sure that those things are coming from what? Pure heart. So the pure heart is determined to measure every decision in life according to God's inspired word. They have predetermined holiness to be a priority in their lives. So what is the issue? Give your heart to God. Make the things he loves the things you love. That's not going to happen by accident. If you don't hate what God hates and love what God loves, God does not have your heart. Certainly, we'd expect that of a husband and wife, wouldn't we? They have to share common beliefs. That's why God says, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. In, the, in, in that context, uh, within churches and within a relationship with your wife. So as a common outcome of the failure to give God the throne of our hearts from which to reign... Marriages end up in separation, family divorce because of unscriptural practices. Mom and dad are constantly fighting. Dad and mom are constantly fighting. Kids are fighting with each other. Uh, we can't get along. Uh, the society is, ends up in heading uh, towards violence and war. It all began in the home. What is the great travesty of uh, our black cultures today? Is it because they're black? No. It's because there's no dads in the home. And the cultures are falling apart. Somebody called me a racist one time. I said, well, I don't even believe in racists. There's only one. Black isn't a race, it's a color. Brown isn't a race, it's a color. White isn't a race, it's a color. In any shade in between, somebody asked me what uh, what race are you? I said, I'm human. And then they said, well, what color are you? I said, well, I'm kind of pink with brown spots all over. See, they always want to divide us like this. We ought not to let that happen. You see, children raised in those homes are quick to reject the hypocrisy of their parents. Because their parents have a profession of faith in Christ, when the throne that they uh, have in their homes really are, are absent of, of parents being doers of the word and not hearers only. That's hypocrisy. <laughs> you might fool a few people, but you're not going to fool your kids. Kids are smart. We have a whole group of people saying, well, kids are idiots. Did they? No, they're not. They're doing exactly what they see. And praise God for a few of them that rise up above the scum on the pond and, and want to really live for the Lord. Kids are smart. They see through the facade quicker than anyone else. Now hopefully they can understand that just because somebody else lives that way, they, that doesn't mean they should. Just because somebody else is destroying their lives, that doesn't mean they should. They get to have their own choice. So the appearance is that, like the world, Christians are out of control. 
And that is what 2 Peter 1, 1 through 11 tells us why Christians are out of control. It tells us why. And in 2 Peter 1, 3, Peter begins this epistle about living in the last days with a reminder that believers have been, what? Given all things that are necessary for a life of godliness because they each have received God's in, uh, divine power. It should be received, they're not received. They received it. The divine nature, the impartation of the divine nature. Now look at that word divine. Got a pen or a pencil, you can write some notes down. Here, this word in, in, in 2 Peter 1, 3, from the Greek word theos. It means something which belongs to the Godhead. The word divine in 2 Peter 1, 3 refers to the power that the Godhead reside, reside, or that resides in the Godhead, the power that the Godhead possesses. Now that power resides in you. It refers to the indwelling Holy Spirit who will empower, who will enable the believer to be the kind of person described in verses 5 and 8, 5, five through 8. So according to 2 Peter 1, 4, because we have trusted in Jesus Christ for our salvation, we rest in the wonderful promises of God. And one of those promises is that when Christ left, another comforter would come to aid believers to live the way Christ had taught them to live. He wouldn't leave them alone in the darkness. And that is what is meant by that we might be. Subjunctive mood is what? What is a subjunctive mood? Possibility. Possibility. So that we might be partakers of of the divine nature. Now, because we've received the indwelling Holy Spirit to enable us to live the way Christ taught, we can also, it is a possibility, participate in or partner with the nature that belongs to the Godhead. That's part of our theantropic union. Theos, God, anthropos, man, now united into one being through the indwelling presence of God. That's that divine nature. What that means is there's absolutely no excuse for the slightest deviation from God's word. Secondly, with that truth there, you have an inner witness to you as you study the word of God and pray and ask God to give you illumination that the spirit of God will give you understanding. Now you're going to have to study, right? It's a study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman who needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You're going to have to study to do that. Not just a matter of just reading it and getting a superficial understanding of it. You're going to have to study it. That's comparing scripture with scripture. Looking at the pro progressive revelation of God. Uh, um, we could spend the rest of the morning on that. Do not run, of course, by this truth that we find here in 2 Peter uh, chapter uh, 1, verse 4. Don't run by it at 100 miles an hour. Stop there for a moment. Look at it. And ask yourself this question. How am I doing with this? How am I doing with this? When we see Christians out of control of the Spirit of God and living carnally, it's because they fail or refuse to utilize one of the most precious gifts of salvation. That's the indwelling presence and enabling power of the Holy Spirit of God. It's either that or it's one other thing. What is that? They're not saved. They don't have any concern about the things of God. They prayed a prayer, walked an aisle, got dunked in the tank. They're members of a church, but they do not care one little bit about whether or not their everyday lives are pleasing and a blessing to God. Long as we can fool everybody else. Now look, the only one you're fooling is you and other people maybe, but you're not fooling God, and that's the one you've got to deal with. And that is why Christ said that those will come to him that in that day, that day of judgment, 
Lord, have we not cast out demons in thy name? Have we not done many wonderful works? And he said, oh, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. There's going to be some people that fall down on their knees right then. But it'll be too late. When Christians fail to recognize sin, they quench his enabling power and grieve him. And the effects of that upon their lives, specifically in the cause of Christ in general, is devastating. We justify so many. Now, according to 2 Peter 1 4, the Spirit of God is given to us that we might, subjective mood, escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. Your sin nature hasn't been eradicated, it's still there, and your biggest enemy is not. Satan, their biggest enemy is you, the old man. If you don't understand that by now, as a Christian, you probably get back to the cross and reevaluate your salvation. When we refuse to recognize the sin of which he convicts us, we quench his divine nature and his working in our lives. Otherwise, we put a stop to it. The word quench means to stop. The enabling power, like throwing water on a fire. That's what we're doing. Well, so it's simply two reasons why we don't have the power of God in our lives. One, we're living carnally. Two, we quench the Spirit. So the indwelling Holy Spirit as God is the only means by which the believer can be enabled to habitually escape the corrupting influences of this world and our own fallen nature. Now God's given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. There is no excuse. He gives us the strength to say no to sin. He gives us the strength to say yes to righteousness. So he gives us the insight, wisdom, to see our own self-deception and our own blindness to our own failings. If we look. And when we look, we ought to come to God and do what? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So all of these things require the enabling power of the Holy Spirit. That is what grace means. So much false teaching on this today. It's pathetic. But faith in Christ for salvation is just a new beginning. For 2 Peter 1.5. In salvation, we are assured of spending eternity with God. We, we have a new birth. However, new baby Christians are expected to grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Fallen trees bring forth no fruit. Now, let's read this text. Three, chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. He's laid a lot of foundations for this if you want to read the previous text and then come back here to this. But it says, nevertheless, we, according to his promise, what? Look for new heavens and a new earth. That's, what, that's our preoccupation. Our focus is upon that. Wherein dwelleth righteousness. Hallelujah. Wherefore, Beloved, seeing that you look for such things, what? Be diligent. What's that word mean again? Extreme effort. Great focus. What? Yeah, exactly. Anything you want to add to that to, to emphasize this, uh, this, this focus of what God is saying here? Be diligent that you may be found of him in peace. Now look at it. Without spot and blameless. <clears throat> now it is the bridegroom's job to keep us without spot and blameless. That when we come before him at the marriage supper of the Lamb, we come to him as a bride adorned in white. Pure. But this text tells us that something else. It's also our responsibility. So it is a partnership with God. That is what the word 
uh, back there, we are partakers of the divine nature. As then it goes on in verse 15, and account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Even as our beloved Paul also according to the wisdom given unto him hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures under their own destruction. I like verse 17. Ye therefore, beloved, saying you know these things before, beware, lest ye also, being led, uh, led away with the air of the wicked, fall. That word means actually to drop away or get off course, to slide away from where you're supposed to be. Now, I remember years ago going down to the river to go fishing. And as you got close to the river bank, you get, you get into this area that it was wet and the, and the earth was wet. And if you weren't careful, you ended up in the river, right? Because the ground was not uh, dry <laughs> and you could easily slip. And that is a metaphor that we find here. Make sure you're careful when you get close to these things that, that uh, you're walking very carefully. Lest you fall. You're led away with the air of the wicked. Fall, drop away, get off course from your own steadfastness. Not talking about losing salvation. Your own steadfastness. What's that? Faithfulness to holiness. Not salvation. But grow. This is the imperative mood. Abel, what's the imperative mood again? Good. See, he's learning. The imperative mood here. That's a commandment. But grow in grace. That's a commandment. Now, if grace is the enabling of the indwelling spirit of God, and you're to grow in it, what does God expect? When you grow, what happens to you? You get bigger. Broader, taller, whatever the case might be. You get bigger. So what is the concept here of growing in grace? Increase. You ought to be doing better every year, every day, every month. Grow in grace, and then what's the next word? And. Otherwise, not just grow in grace, in the enabling of God, and in continuity of the imperative mood. Otherwise, you still have an imperative from verse 18, grow. Now we have continuity of that imperative, and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's a personal relational knowledge. What's to grow in those two things? In your relationship with Christ. And then why? To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. What does that mean? Well, to be glory means to bring revelation to the world of Jesus Christ by the way you live. Now, growing in grace is a result of working in cooperation, participation, partnership with the Holy Spirit to add certain characteristics to our new life in Christ. What does that mean? Increase. We're growing. Increase is taking place. I've never known a person to succeed in escaping the corruption that's in the world through lust while refusing to recognize the Holy Spirit's conviction of sin and beginning to seek his power to live victorious over the flesh. Otherwise, they can hear it from a preacher, but eventually it no longer applied to them. It's applied to somebody else, but not to them. They don't hear this text and say, well, that's, that's, that's me. When was the last time you asked yourself whether you're growing in grace? Whether or not you've evaluated yourself? When is the last time you asked yourself whether you were growing in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? In your relationship with him? Are you concerned about it? Now camp for a while there in 2 Peter 1.6 on this character called temperance. 
What does the word mean? Self-control. Now, I know that I can't control this old man. I can try to. I, I can throttle him. I can give him in a headlock. and I can stomp on him and I can hold him down. But you know what? He keeps rising up. And that's why Paul says, I die daily. He says, I'm, uh, you know, the, the whole concept that, uh, you know, of second, uh, Galatians 2.20 is very much. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. In the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's a concept that we have to realize. It's not going to happen by accident. Why are so many Christians out of control? Why is it they don't think about these things? Why aren't they concerned about these things? I think the primary reason is a lot of Christians are looking for knowledge of the Bible, but not application of the Bible. Otherwise, I know some truths, and I'm learning a lot of doctrine, but... You see, when that happens and you take that out of the person and the transition and, the, and the, uh, what you might say is the transformation of those truths in the practices of our lives, then there's a reason why the young people think we're hypocrites. Now, we have to understand and we have to communicate with our young people that we're in the battle just like they are and we're not going to always make it. But we're trying so, when a person is out of control, it means he's out of the Holy Spirit's control and in the flesh. And when you are in the flesh, you are always out of control and carnal. And a spiritual person is spiritual because he's under the control of the Spirit and begins to bear the fruit of the Spirit in his life. Now, you want these things in your life? Sit down with your family and have a round of prayer. And each of you go to God and say, here's God, here's what I want in my life. And we as a family, we're going to commit ourselves as a family to these things. Beginning with the pursuit of a pure heart. Holiness. Now where a person is out of control, it is most evident in his emotions. What you are emotionally is visible manifestation of what you are as a person and your level of spiritual growth. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Sometimes you need to speak, but how you speak is important. Sometimes you don't need to speak. Sometimes you can just walk away. Remember, spiritual growth is measured by the degree our lives are yielded to the Holy Spirit and the percentage of time that yielding exists. Let me say it again. Spiritual growth is measured by the degree of our lives yielded to the Holy Spirit and the percentage of time that yielding exists. That's a pretty important text because we might have moments when we're yielded. But what's the span of time that that goes? And then how quickly do we recognize when we get out of control of the Spirit of God, confess that to God and get it right? How many times a day does that take place? With me, it's pretty steady. I don't know about you. You see, when that happens, the majority of people do not control their emotions. Their emotions control them. They are out of control. And from, that, from our last lesson, that, rec that, that recognizing the evident characteristics of the flesh of sin is the first step in bringing it under control. Our excuse is, well, everybody's a sinner. I'm, nobody's perfect. Wait a minute, doesn't God command us to be holy as he is holy? So is that an excuse before God? Go ahead, try that one with God. Go to God and say, well, you know, God, nobody's perfect. We're all sinners. God's going to say, yeah. I gave you my spirit to correct that problem. And you've been wasting what I've given you. So the majority of decisions we make are greatly influenced by our emotions. However, when decisions are determined by carnal emotions, they are almost always wrong decisions. 
When I hear people make what I what are obviously wrong decisions made up emotionally, my uh, a counsel to them is, I think you better pray about that one. I think you better pray about that. Why? Because they're going to hurt themselves, and in the in the process, the process of it all, they're going to hurt a lot of other people. I know men who are not in the ministry, good, godly pastors, who are not in the ministry today because their churches beat up on them. I've known people who have left churches because of, of what people have said out of emotional outburst and total irrationality. For instance, how many people choose a husband or wife based upon strong feelings? They call it love. How many people do that? Almost all of them. How many relationships have been destroyed because of out of control anger, which is a feeling, an emotion? That finally you get to that place, you say, I'm not gonna do I'm not gonna put up with this anymore, and I'm gonna go get a lawyer. How many people have quit marriage because they have a feeling of lost hope? See, there's, there's, there's no loss of hope there. Now, emotions are certainly part of the spiritual construct of our creation by God. However, that spiritual construct is fallen and therefore broken. And we shouldn't let that broken uh, nature, that fallen nature, govern us. And we'll pick up there next week. Any questions, comments you have this morning? Justice. Can you speak more on the keeping of your hearts? The the keeping of the heart is primarily just yielding it. To keep means to preserve. And uh, that's just the same meaning, I mean, throughout the whole Old Testament. To preserve it or to keep it where it belongs to be. And uh, that is kind of like... Uh, you know, you walk outside the doors of the church and you have a closed community here, a corporate ethic that is quite uh, narrow and specific. But you walk outside the confines of the church and there's no one there to watch you or see you. Uh, you have to keep your heart within the specifics of that corporate ethic that God defines by his word. When you move outside and you move into a broader corporate ethic, you want to bring your biblical corporate ethic with you and be an influence against the things of the world, not vice versa. But what happens as soon as we move outside, that new corporate ethic begins to overwhelm us, and we no longer respond according to the dictates and absolutes of the convictions of the Word of God. We begin to silence ourselves, censor ourselves and uh, become allow certain things to go on with our broader corporate ethic, corporate ethic we would never allow in the church right that's what it means to keep the heart I think the broadest meaning of it is keep it yielded to the spirit of God preserve it well you almost got another sermon there Justice. How's that? anything else this morning